Today we're taking a first look at this custom frame from Axial Bikes. I love featuring small builders on this channel. There are so many incredible craftsmen out there and people willing to think outside the box and risk takers who are willing to step outside their comfort zone and start a bike company and start building their frames. And small builders are so much fun to work with. And to date, my all-time favorite rides have been built by small builders. These frames are handmade by GP, GP Wagenfuhr out of Canyon City, Colorado. I'm not very familiar with the company. I've been seeing his stuff on Instagram. I really like his radical approach to geometry. And I reached out to him and we filled out a fit form just like I was a normal customer. He said, fill out this form, tell me what you like, tell me what you're looking for. We consulted together and this is what we came up with. I know exactly what I want in a trail riding hardtail and that's why I designed my Maniac. It's exactly what I want. But it gives up a little bit in the bike packing world and I thought if I were to design a bike packing specific bike, how would I design it? And this is my first attempt to how I would do it. We've got short stays, we've got sliding dropouts so I can change the geo. I could do single speed if I want. I wanted tons of tire clearance. I love bike packing on 29 by 3 O's because here in the Southwest, we get a lot of sand, a lot of riverbeds, and having that big flotation is more comfortable. I feel like it carries weight a little bit better. Uh, they're taller tires, so they roll over things better. And I just, I just like the cushion and feel on a bikepacking bike. So I designed it with big tire clearance in mind. He assures me it'll fit 29 by 2.8s. We'll see if we could go even bigger. Reroute Outdoors partnered with this project and they made this custom frame bag and a top tube bag and it integrates so nicely with the design of this frame. So it's completely bolt on. There are no straps going across the tubes. For a painted bike that sees a lot of uh, use on bumpy backpacking roads, straps can rub your frame and clear coat and rub through the paint. That's why I never love bike packing with carbon frames unless you cover them in tape and make sure nothing can rub through. So this is a really clean look. I pulled the bag off and weighed this frame and it came in at 6.14 pounds, which is amazing for sliding dropouts. I see a lot of companies building hardtails way beefier than they need to be these days. ISO st testing, you know, make sure they can handle certain strength loads. And that makes sense when you're mass producing thousands of those and you don't know if your guy's gonna be a 300 pound linebacker hucking off 10 foot stairs or if it's gonna be a 125 pound teenager who's racing their first XC race. And definitely the right frame for the 125 pound XC racer is not the right frame for the 300 pounder. So ISO testing, which almost every massive company goes for, it ensures it'll hold up to the 300 pounder but that comes at the expense of everyone under 200 pounds or so. It just makes for a stiff and less lively ride. Well, these small builders can custom pick the tube set, the thickness, the design, the strength for what you need. I really like compliance. I told him that I really like compliance. I'd rather the frame was a little bit more on the soft slash noodly side than full on anvil rattle your fillings out stiffness side. The most supple bikes I've ridden were hand-built bikes that did not pass ISO testing. In fact, when I was chatting with Shell from Money Bicycles, I was chatting with him and just said, hey, how much is, you know, how much stock should I put into ISO testing? And he said, ISO testing ruins the ride of a bike. And I thought that was really interesting. It's a great way to ensure your bike's gonna be plenty strong, but some of these small builders, well, let's face it, every bike's different and they can't send it off to be destroyed and then build a new one. So this is not ISO tested. Most custom frames aren't. And that's probably why they ride so good. I Like it's a noticeable difference from these small, really nice hand-built frames than something mass produced overbuilt. As always, it depends on the brand, it depends on the bike. So I don't wanna make sweeping blanket statements, but my favorite riding hardtails for feel have been the handmade one-off small stuff. And you're gonna pay more for that. You know, this is the type of bike you're going to pay a craftsman to really put his heart and soul into. And he has thought of some really interesting things that big bike manufacturers still won't be thinking about in 10 years. So I really love featuring small builders because they are passionate about their craft. They're willing to take risks or else they wouldn't have started their bike company. And I'm a small business owner myself and I just love supporting people that are out there chasing their passions. So this frame is steel. I didn't mention that. This frame is steel. We've got some bike packing rack mounts here. I love thin tubes. 
Look at that, it's not overly braced. I really like that. Now with an axle in there, this will all stiffen up. It's meant to be worked as a system. So don't think this is just gonna be a noodly bike, but the thickness of your tubing really makes a huge difference. All right, let's see what size tires we can fit in here. Here's a 29 by 28 on a 40i rim. Oh yeah. These Terra Bales worked well for me in Colorado, but they did not work well for me in Arizona. Oh yeah, that's got clearance. So we've got seven mil clearance on each side on a 2.8, wow. And the dropouts are probably 75% back. So let's measure the chain stay length. So that is at a 428 chain stay. That's impressive. I don't think I'll be able to slam it all the way forward. This is as far forward as I would want to run it. We've only got three mil clearance here, but this is a 422 chainstay. Very impressive. He also tried a new thing here, angling the dropout. So as you lengthen the chainstay, it lowers the bottom bracket. And I love that creative thinking that you get from these smaller builders. All right, let's see if a 29 by 30 fits. Now I haven't met GP, but my communication with him has been fantastic and I really appreciate his attention to detail. The notes he sent with this bike far surpass any other bike I've received. He has really thought of a lot of cool details and you can tell he loves his craft. Okay, so we're rubbing here, not surprisingly. I'm gonna show you something interesting in just a minute about the height difference between a 2.6 and a 2.8 and a 3.0. That's the biggest difference. All right, here we are pretty far back. 3.0's clearing, no problem. I can come forward a little. Oh yeah. That's pretty close. I might get a little bit of flex, but the further back I move it, the more clearance I get. That's a 4.30 chain stay, impressive. So when I work with a lot of companies and tell them I want massive clearance, they say, no way, forget it. But smaller builders like Axial are not afraid to try new things. And I know I pushed him on this to get these to fit and props to him for getting these to fit. This is a 29 by 26 and it measures 740 mil tall. This is a 29 by 28 and it's measuring to 764 tall. This is a 29 by 30 and it measures 765 this is a little bit smaller tread tread matters tire width matters rim width matters but what we don't often think about is how much taller these big tires are this 29 by 30 is at least an inch taller than the 29 by 26 and i just wanted to point that out because a lot of people don't think there's a big difference there's a huge difference especially with what fits in your frame and in your fork and you actually feel how it rolls over things differently just like how a 29er and a 27.5 are only an inch and a half difference, the difference between a 29 by 2.3 and a 29 by 3.0 is night and day, and that 3.0 rolls over stuff so much better. That's one big reason why I like it for bikepacking. Also, he's using a T47 bottom bracket, which I love, and it's got internal cable routing for the dropper, everything else is external, with a stainless tube inside to prevent rattle, and it stays inside here and never exits. I love that. I love it for bike packing. I love it for a clean look. And I love it to not have these sharp kinks outside of the frame. Another really cool thing about this frame is he's using 3D printed yokes. Now that's how I found out about Axial. There's this guy, Daniel, out there making some really unique 3D printed parts to open up options for frame builders and I noticed Axial was using them. So that's why I reached out. I wanted to see what it's like. Newhouse Metalworks uses them. Sometimes Manzanita uses them. There's a couple other small builders using them, but I'm really intrigued by this um, 3D printed technology and how it can help even these craft hand-built frame makers make something easier and faster. Now the cherry on top of this already beautiful frame is this stainless steel rack that he made me. This is an experiment. You know I love racks for bike packing, but he designed it to go right here and I really like his thought behind it. I like racks for lots of reasons. First of all, I can lower my dropper. When I run a saddle bag on a normal tire and I run my dropper, it drops the bag into the tire and I can't use a dropper. 
And here in Arizona on the Arizona trail and the technical stuff that we have for bike packing, I need a dropper. So I run racks. We can also mount water bottles on here. We can mount anything cages. This is not a cheap add-on. It, it might look cheap to someone who's never built something, but stainless is not cheap. And this looks extremely time consuming to build, but I'm excited to experiment with that. Interestingly enough, he also says it noticeably stiffens up the bike, which I could imagine. I want to make sure that doesn't interfere with the brake. That'll be interesting. If I slide the dropouts all the way forward, it might be close. I might have to slide them back just a little. Anyway, super cool of him to include that in my build. And that's the benefit of a custom build is you can do crazy wild things that you could never do on a normal bike. This is looking cool with all the stainless and raw aluminum on here. I've run into a problem and this is what happens when we get experimental. So here's my Paul clamper. I need to run a spacer because this is a 180 mil rotor. And when we do that, unfortunately, it contacts the rack. This has been an interesting experiment. So I can go down to a 160 rotor here. Plenty of clearance here though. This is a 2.6 tire on a 40i rim. I could also slide the chain stays back a bit, but I really want them short. I love short chain stays. So uh, I got to check seat clearance. If seat clears, then I'm going to swap this to a 160. If the seat doesn't clear, there's no real sense in running this rack. This came out stunning. This is one of the best looking builds I've done between the raw tie, the aluminum, the stainless. It just all ties it together really well. I even found some blue grips in my bin to match these bags. So here's what we've got rolling. We've got GTL bike carbon rims with an Onyx Classic rear hub. We have got 29 by 2.6 tires. So we've got the axial custom frame here that I built for bike packing. We have the rear rack, which totally clears the dropper. I'm testing out a PNW Coast dropper. It's got some squish built into it. And a lot of you have been curious about it. I haven't tried it yet. A lot of people think, hey, you're riding a hardtail. Why not have a squishy seat? Usually when I want suspension, it's when I'm standing up, not sitting down. But we're going to see if over the course of a four-day trip, this suspension gives me a lot of comfort and control, or if it just feels a little bit more gimmicky and might be better for something like a gravel bike. We've got the five dev 165 mil cranks on here. I've got a coupon code for these if you're looking to get some sweet, unique cranks. Wheels manufacturing T47 bottom bracket. We've got my Paul Clamper mechanical disc brakes. For drivetrain, I am going experimental, way experimental. I've got the MicroShift Advent X 10 speed shifter to an 11 speed GX derailleur. They have the same pull between um, Advent X and SRAM 11 speed. All my Advent X derailers are beat up. I've bashed them into rocks too much. So I grabbed this 11 speed. I really had to crank on that B tension and you got to get the chain length perfect on these things. The cage is a little bit shorter, but it's actually shifting really, really well. I've got a 10 speed chain on right now, but I'd like to try an 11 speed. I've heard the 11 speeds actually shift a little better with these Advent X. So I've got the Advent X 10 speed cassette, which is pretty cool to be experimenting with. This rack is really cool. I'm so excited to load it up and I still get to use my dropper. There's some really cool things going on with the frame. Super short seat tube. I could run a much, much, much longer dropper, but I wanted to test the PNW Coast dropper in here on this trip that I've got coming up. But I love that not only is it a short seat tube, but it's straight for a long time. And it has these two holes to receive the bag, but the bolts do not poke through and penetrate to where the dropper is. So I can use all of this for the dropper. Way to go. Let's see. I'm running a SID Select Plus up front. Um, I like that fork. I don't like it quite as much as a Stepcast 34, but my Stepcast 34 is on the shop getting rebuilt right now. Uh, we've got the Stanton tie bars, 9.8 stem. Wheels are a little bit interesting. They're GTL bike 40i rims, carbon rims. They're a pretty stiff wheel. So I went with some big tires. I went with 2.6s on here. I normally reserve 2.6s for a 35i rim, but I really wanted to try the bigger volume for bike packing. And I think this is actually really cool to see how much these ballooned up. It's gonna be an experiment. I've got an Onyx Classic rear hub and I've just got a cheap SRAM front hub because a front hub is a front hub. I can't tell the difference between a $40 front hub and a $200 front hub. And I know you guys don't believe me, but these Onyx hubs really are silent. 
They are silent hub. They're as noisy as a front hub. No noise. Pretty awesome. Reroute did a killer job on these bags. They fit this frame to a T. And sometimes you get custom bags that like, they look close, but this looks like the frame was built around the bags instead of the bags built around the frame. I'm curious to see if this is gonna flop around through use. Normally I've got a strap going around the stem for my top tube bag here, but that's all part of the experiment. Man, I'm so excited to get this thing on the trail loaded up. Okay, let's throw it on the geo meter to see what the actual geo numbers came out to for my custom build. Now, bikepacking is a really broad term, just like mountain biking is a broad term. Some people mountain bike on rigid single speeds, others mountain bike on full on downhill machines. And I think I should clarify what bikepacking means to me. To me, bikepacking means carrying all of your food and clothing and sleeping gear and tent and bike repair gear to have backcountry adventures away from civilization. For some people, it's staying in a hotel every night and eating at restaurants. And their needs are very different than mine, carrying tents, four days worth of food and water, etc. So I like a bike that is going to be comfortable in the saddle all day too. I don't want a super long, stretched out, super slack, super aggressive hardtail like I would ride for a double black diamond. So I designed this to be a little bit shorter in the cockpit, a little bit steeper head angle. I still wanted the tall stack. I still wanted the short chain stays, but I wanted clearance for the big tires. So here's what we got. Head angle is 65.5 degrees. Effective seat tube angle is 74.5 degrees. Oh, rear center is 410. That is crazy short. And then chain stay with these two sixes is 415. Front center, 740. Reach is a short 425. Wow, that is shorter reach than I thought, but a slacker seat angle, so it's going to work out. Hmm. This will be interesting to see. I do like a more compact ride. I like the Stanton Sherpa 17 inch. It's a little bit more compact than its geo chart suggests, and it bike packs really well. Stack is coming in at 582, and that's with a 120 mil fork. So with another 10, it'd be 592. A little bit shorter stack as well than I run on a lot of my bikes. And we have a 66 mil bottom bracket drop. That should feel nice and stable. So yeah, this ended up being a little bit shorter in the reach and a little bit slacker in the seat tube and slacker in the head tube than the CAD file that we had designed around this, but it's still pretty close. This thing turned out so cool. I think it's stunning. I love the powder coat on it. It's got some metal flake in it. It's nice, a dark kind of brown burgundy color. The blue bags look fantastic with it. And all the titanium and stainless and aluminum hardware on it just looks fantastic. What a beautiful, beautiful bike. Final weight came in just over 33 pounds with the rack, with the bags. Um, and this whole setup, the Onyx hub is quite heavy and that you will notice that on the scales and the Paul clampers are quite heavy. But for bike packing, those are my favorite hubs and my favorite brakes. And I just love that setup. And when you're putting 15, 20 pounds of gear and food and water on your bike, an extra pound or two of, of quality gear that you can trust in the backcountry is totally worth it to me. But I'm not racing, you know, some people are bikepacking racing and they're going as light as possible and not taking a tent or a sleeping bag and just getting their weight down to every little ounce. I don't know if this setup is for you, but for me and how I like to bike pack and explore, I don't mind the extra little bit of weight. We know the frame it was nice and light, so it's not the frame's fault, it's all the parts that I put on it. What a special bike. Looking up close, um, the, the finish is beautiful. The paint is absolutely incredible. The welds look good. They're not like a stack of dimes like you see coming out of China or Nick at Newhouse Metalworks work, but they look good. They look, they look fine, they just don't look perfect. And that's okay for small builders. And the look of a weld says so little about the weld, but usually someone who can get that stack of dimes has spent thousands of hours welding frames. And so we imply that a stack of dimes means a stronger, better built frame. You never know though, It's it could just be aesthetics. So welds look good. They're not gonna blow you away like stack of dimes. They're a heck of a lot better than my TIG welds look. So no criticism here, I'm just telling you what I see on this. All right, this thing is so cool. It's time to get this thing dirty, 
get it in the mountains and let you hear what this silent hub sounds like. Thanks for watching everybody. There's a party in the mountains and you're invited. <laughs>